Well, hi everybody. <laughs> it's been a little while again. Um, not that long, actually. This is the 6th of February, and I was able to do something yesterday a little bit. We discussed the refinement of the physical body. And I think I had a little bit of um, I think I had something here, yeah, pure food, cleanliness, sleep, sun, and also a couple of extra uh, methods which will be developed perhaps more in the future than at the present moment. Um, the use of colored lights and music. These are ways of purifying the physical body. Why do we have to purify the physical body? So that it can be a true uh, receiving instrument for the higher um, inflows or downflows from higher points of tension. At least the first four seem uh, very accessible in most cases. Pure food, well, that's becoming maybe a little more of a problem. Cleanliness, most of us have water at our um, disposal. Sleep, well, <laughs> it's a hectic time in humanity uh, and the, in the aspirational mantram that we're introduced to right away, to forego peace, to forfeit rest, and in the stress of pain to lose myself and find myself, thus entering into peace. But we have some control over that. Uh, depending on where we live, the sun is more or less accessible. You know, up here in the far north, um, it may be a sunny day, but it's also uh, well below zero uh, Celsius and even below zero centigrade, I mean uh, Fahrenheit. As for colored lights, well, um, they can be engineered. And um, I've had some friends in uh, Denmark, who worked uh, very much with these, putting some kind of uh, radiatory crystal on an apparatus that uh, spread the light. And music, well, perhaps it's according to people's taste, but we are talking about specialized music in uh, particular composers, perhaps, for certain conditions that people have and also music that is uh, presented in a certain key or maybe uh, even a certain mode. So I think a lot has to be developed there. Now we also have um, some information on the next type of refinement, and it's going to be the etheric body. So we're ascending step by step, and this coincides with that of the physical body. Now, I've always wondered about the coinciding exactly. Is it atom for atom? Is it cell for cell? Um, that has never been entirely clear to me. Because when you think about the probable construction of the etheric body, um, you wonder whether there's an absolutely one-to-one -one correspondence with the physical body. 
But anyway, uh, the method is clear. The method consists principally of living in the sunlight, in protection from the cold, and in the assimilation of certain definite combinations of vitamins, which will before long be given to the race. Now, this is written in 1920, and uh, I don't know, can we call it um, vitaminology? <laughs> we have uh, had in a hundred years tremendous advancement regarding the knowledge of vitamins. Now, some people do overdo it, you know, get kind of a vitaminosis. But in any case, um, you do wonder whether these combinations have been given to the race. A combination of these vitamins will be formulated and made into tabloid tablet form with direct effect upon the etheric body. Now, um, so it makes you wonder, we have the general idea that the vitamins are very healthy and uh, perhaps some think of them in terms of the etheric body, uh, but maybe the kinds of combinations that he's talking about will not yet have been given because he says, this will not be until that etheric vehicle is recognized by science and definitely included in the training offered by the faculty of medicine. Now, let's be realistic about that. Let's see, what, what do we have here? I want to reduce this just a little bit. Okay. One, two, that will do it. And, uh, Yeah, that should do it. So this is obviously not yet the case. Uh, maybe in uh, certain advanced cases, uh, there are medical students who um, know something about the etheric body. And uh, maybe uh, in China, where the meridians are understood so well, <clears throat> I think um, the etheric body much better understood than in the uh, West. Um, maybe some of this has begun to happen. But if you look at the particular training, that students um, receive, I think we find um, that medical students are not given this uh, kind of uh, point of view. We're still very much into allopathic medicine and uh, vibratory uh, medicine subtle medicine, um, whether it's the vibrations of music or the vibrations of color, these things are considered um, tangential and considered by many to be inaccurate. They're so still tied in with the uh, allopathic model where um, uh, matter is cured by matter. The study of etheric diseases, now, how do they classify themselves? Congestion and atrophy will ere long be, recogni be a recognized study and will lead to definite um, treatments and formulas. As before said, all you can do now is uh, in sensitizing the dual physical, 
<clears throat> because the etheric is considered to be physical, as well you know. Um, so it's not yet that this is uh, scientifically available to us. And the real studies have been made, at least here in the West, although I'm sure that in Chinese and Tibetan medicine, the methods of sustaining the etheric body are known. But all you can do now in sensitizing the dual physical is to attend to the above rules uh, and allow um, time to bring about the remainder of the work. Now, you know, he really hasn't said too much here, has he? But he's given just um, a few hints. Um, about congestion and atrophy, the two extremes, one leading perhaps to hypervitalization and maybe the production of uh, tumors and uh, growths which uh, have been stimulated, or congestion can lead itself to um, a dearth of stimulation and hence congestion in one area and atrophy uh, in another. So the basic thing here is uh, sunlight, protection from the cold. In the cold is death. And um, that's been a big battle for humanity across the ages. People live in different kinds of climates, but they've had to somehow uh, weather through the putting on of animal skins uh, as the result of the hunt or, or whether they've learned uh, the process of uh, weaving and how to make their own garments. Uh, in general, they've had to protect themselves from the cold in those ways. Because the inner furnaces will not burn as they should uh, in excessive cold. And of course, sunlight, even in the cold, is better than uh, a gray day in the cold, but uh, sunlight in a reasonable temperature is very restorative and he's told us about the kinds of clothing we can wear to make sure that the pranic triangle and especially the center, the pranic center between the shoulder blades is properly vitalized. Some of these very simple things are going to lead to health. He also says, you know, the spine and the spleen. So the proper adjustment there of the spine and uh, the unclogging of the spleen, I suppose, somehow the uh, functionality of the spleen will all help us to be rid of the um, uh, the ills <laughs> that flesh is heir to, so just a little bit there. That's all he all he decided to give us, and at that time, a hundred years ago, about old books being of value. Well, I guess I can say that. Uh, the Secret Doctrine is an old book of extreme value. The Yoga Sutras by Patanjali are 
a very old book, maybe 10,000 years old, and of extreme value. You know, we can't say, oh, that was written by Patanjali uh, millennia ago. So it's not of value. Though sometimes there are books that just mark the way, however old they may be. And if we're looking at the New Testament as of great value, DK says it should be among the few books which every disciple has, you know, along with the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras. They're all old, but they have made their mark. So age itself does not discount their value. This love of um, novelty can present us with many um, distorted images, and many glamorous thoughts that inspire us to action under the spell of glamour. So newness is no um, guarantee of spiritual value. Look at the Upanishads. Look how old they are, just millennia old. And yet they've made their mark and stand as uh, guides, guideposts, uh, along the uh, endless way. Now we come to the refining of the emotional body. Um, maybe a little more is said here. Here the method of procedure is different. The emotional body is simply a great reflector. It takes color and movement from its surroundings it receives the impress of every passing desire. It contacts every whim and fancy. You know, th these have to do, I suppose, with imaginings. Those two words, whim and fancy, not really thought through. Just a, a possible thought with its emotional impulse. It contacts every whim and fancy in its environment. Every current sets its motion. Every sound causes it to vibrate unless the aspirant inhibits such a state of affairs and trains it to receive and register only those impressions which come from the intuitional level via the higher self, you know, the intuitional level is buddhic. It's beyond what we often call the higher self, which is the consciousness in the egoic lotus. Um, so, which comes via the intuitional level, via the higher self, and therefore via the atomic subplane. Um, I suppose the atomic subplane of the uh, emotional level. Okay, so the method is different. It's just a great reflector. But we seem to have a choice about what it will reflect. Seems to be very sensitive, but in a way too inclusive of every possible ripple uh, in the uh, outer and inner environment. So, um, you know, as they say here, every current sets it in motion. Every sound causes it to vibrate unless the aspirant inhibits such a state of affairs. And maybe that's easier to do 
with a uh, well, may I, maybe we learn something on about that with a ray one astral body, with a ray six astral body, not usually, but maybe ray two is a little more passive in that respect, and um, is attuned to the buddhic uh, or intuitional level, the love wisdom level corresponds with the second ray, and that's the sixth principle, counting from below. And um, here's the characteristic quality of buddhi, or the intuition. It has everything to do with, uh, finally, universal love, as we learn in the beginning of uh, the book Glamour, a World Problem, the very beginning, the first few pages. So we'll learn what can be a healthy inhibition, if there is such a thing, or a kind of a deflecting or ignoring, uh, or a deliberate non-responsiveness to currents of lesser value or currents which simply mislead. So many people are subject in their emotions to glamours which mislead them under the guise of truth and impel them to action which leads nowhere positive. Okay. Now, what should we do about it? And it's difficult at uh, a time of the changing of the major zodiacal energies, especially with the sign so emotional as Pisces, the aim of the aspirant should be to, to so train the emotional body that it will become still and clear as a mirror so that it may reflect perfectly. And that, you know, if we have achieved the uh, second ray astral body, you know, I, I don't think everybody is just born with it. You know, the tendency seems to be more to have the sixth ray astral body and occasionally for therapeutic purposes and purposes of expulsion or maybe of real suppression of certain tendencies the first gray astral body will be chosen for a disciple or an aspirant, but not for an ordinary, non-aspiring human being. But then eventually the second ray astral body, I think, uh, can be achieved. And stillness, we know, can be correlated with the second ray astral body. So both, whoop, that's not it, is it? So, um, I'll just kind of copy that to mark it. Still and clear, and the clarity, of course, clarity of thinking is aided by the second ray astral body. So um, let's just say both of these are aided by the second ray astral body. Okay. His aim should be to make it reflect only the causal body or, you know, something higher, intuition on the buddhic plane, which is more encompassing than anything that can be reached strictly in the causal body. But that has to be proven by us as we 
uh, ascend into the higher points of tension. His aim should be to make it reflect only the causal body and to take on color only in line with the great law. Interesting about color, take on color, color uh, being a veil and uh, yet also um, a method of delivering a particular energy, though veiled, uh, into a lower world. So color can deliver the higher into the lower. But this is uh, interesting. The great law, what is the great law? The great law, you know, the law of love, maybe, in the very large sense. His aim should be to make it reflect only the causal body. I think that is not characteristic of the majority of us, you know, if we lose our temper or fall victim to one of the deleterious emotional states, we ask, are, are we really in our emotional body? reflecting only the causal body? No, we're not. And we have to learn to do that and to move under definite direction. And not just as blow the winds of thought. You know, out on the water, the wind can whip up the water or rise the tides of desire. So let's just say not to be uh, impelled hither and thither because the wind of thought can do that and the uh, the various currents that impact the emotional body, disturbances from the environment can give a great kind of complexity to the emotional life, which at another point, DK says really has to be simplified. So not just as blow the winds of thought or rise the tides of desire. Well, we can, each one of us, assess our own emotional life. What words should describe the emotional body? And I think, you know, we're going to find with these words, uh, a definite kind of indication of the second ray of serenity, of that quality of the Christ, the calmness forever unperturbed. So what words should describe them? The words still, much more easily achieved by the second ray than the third, such that the third ray becomes, uh, or the third ray stillness becomes a watch word, serene, that's not the fourth ray, that's, that's the second ray, unruffled, so that the surface is clear and mirror-like, right, quiet, at rest, limpid, and clear of a quality mirror like of a surface even, you know, so that shall we say the image of the sun is not broken up into a lot of little suns on the wavelets. You've seen what it's like to have the image of the sun reflected on a mirror like even surface. 
the, you know, these are high uh, ideals to be achieved. A limpid reflector, one that accurately, you know, so hence it's cooperation with the fifth ray and the lucidity of mind. When you have a second ray astral body, it does cooperate with uh, a fifth ray use of the mind. One that accurately transmits the wishes, the desires, the aspirations of the ego, and not of the personality. Well, I look back at my life and I say, well, it hasn't been that way. And, you know, maybe some of you have achieved this. It's always good if you can achieve stillness, serenity, unruffledness, quietude. An astral body at rest, limpid and clear clarity, which works against the uh, impulsion by glamour. Mirror-like, but reflecting selectively, reflecting the causal body, reflecting the emotional, uh, the, the, the buddhic sphere, not reflecting every passing current and all of the disturbance of the interactions of those currents. You know, when people have shouting matches with each other, that even occurs, I've been seeing in politics, <laughs> our supposedly uh, deliberative uh, lawmakers and so forth, getting pretty heated under Mars with each other. We have to mar master a certain quality of Mars before this can really, uh, this can really occur. This limpidity this selective reflector. It's a real training, isn't it? And one that is part of the purification of the emotional body. When you have a chaotic and uh, inharmonious, uh, constantly mutating uh, astral body, all those highs and lows, Attractions and repulsions, contesting with each other. The truth just can't get through. I, I always use the image of the sun, you know, on the water. Is it broken up? Is it covered by the waves? Um, its reflection? Or is there such a limpidity that there's a perfect, coherent reflection? Now, how should this be accomplished? In several ways, some at the direction of the aspirant, so we have to do our bit, right? And some at the direction of the master. We can see why it's important to read this book right at the very beginning because it has everything to do with the kind of training that we might undertake for half a century or more. Yes, some of us have been in this for half a century or more. At least in this uh, incarnation, there was always, there's always a moment when you know you have entered the field of spiritual occultism. So what do we do? because that probably is very important. So number one, point A. Um, you know, I like to kind of make some of these outlining points a little bigger or more noteworthy so one doesn't get lost because 
Master DK is forever providing us with uh, detailed outlines, and it's easy to lose one's way without proper memory. By the constant watching of all desires, motives, and wishes that cross the horizon daily, and by the subsequent emphasizing, energy follows thought, of those that are of a high order, and by the inhibition, or at least the deliberate ignoring or devitalizing of the lower ones. So, this seems doable, doesn't it? We can do this. If we will. If we think we've transcended the need to do all this, um, chances are that we have not. So the inner monitor, we become the silent watcher of our own system. And we know how to vitalize the good and devitalize the bad. I could simply say vitalizing the good and devitalizing the bad. You know, we say no to certain thoughts. When you go to page 473 of White Magic, you'll see those 15 councils where he tells you what to throw away and what to keep, you know, cast out all fear, all hate, all greed, you know. Cast out the idle thought, the selfish thought, the cruel, hateful thought because of the poisoning of the system, which can happen, which will happen if we don't cast those things out of our orbit of consciousness. So you can understand that uh, although many of us, let's say, we're no longer in the monastery, we're no longer in the convent, we're no longer sequestered and uh, living some kind of life in retreat, kind of a 12th house life, we have to take what was learned there and some of the high disciplines that are required there and bring them right into the world, which is difficult given all of the currents and cross-currents to which in our modern chaotic living we are subject. Okay, so that, that was the uh, first point in the purification of the astral body. Now, uh, point B here, how else? Uh, after, you know, really keeping a close watch because, you know, in a way we become the silent watcher. Um, and the, um, and the inner, sorry, inner monitor speaks with a strong voice, often yes or no. I'm sure we've all had the experience. Don't touch that hot stove again. Or yes, go that way, uh, even if you feel some fear, trepidation, reluctance, hesitation, go. 
because it's the right way to go. What else? By a constant daily attempt to contact the higher self and to reflect his, interesting, it's his, well, maybe he's trying to make it a little more intimate, to reflect his wishes in the life, you know, um, in a way, there are definitely two. So, obey the inner impulses of the soul. Inquire the way, obey the inner impulses of the soul. Pay no attention to worldly wisdom per se, and set an example. You know, we find these in Treatise on White Magic toward the end. Some of the simplest things are the hardest to actually uh, bring forward because we're going against personal tendency, really. The dweller on the threshold, individual dweller, is not tamed, rendered rightly instrumental by going along with its wishes and desires. So there's going to be a grating that occurs, no way to avoid it. And that battle between the soul and personality can go on for a long time. And he tells us, you know, a number of lives. Maybe we find ourselves even now engaged in it to a greater or lesser extent. So. Contact the higher self and try to reflect uh, his wishes in the life. At first, mistakes will be made. Because, you know, we hear a voice and we think it's the voice of the higher self, but it's not the voice of the silence. Madam Blavatsky's translation of that uh, book of Golden Percept Precepts. At first, mistakes will be made, but little by little, the building in process proceeds and the polarization of the emotional body gradually shifts up each subplane until the atomic is reached. Uh, and that is what we have been told is uh, emotional idealism you know, compared, let's say, with the kind of idealism that is found, uh, is it on the Buddhic plane? You know, page 188, roughly, of a treatise on cosmic fire. Just trying to uh, see that. And if I've run into something that actually works, I'll, you know, show it to you. <laughs> okay. Treatise on Cosmic Fire, 188. And um, so here is the idealism on the astral plane, emotional, but here is, yeah, look at that. Um, on the buddhic plane, we have idealism on the third subplane, showing how that apparently six-ray quality of idealism is related to the number three. Three related to six, two to four, one to two, or two to one. So as we work our way up bit by bit, heightening the point of tension through deflecting of that which would drag us down. We uh, develop these different qualities which are uh, resident upon these various planes and there are sub levels of each one, you know. Also, seven levels of comprehension, seven levels of healing, seven levels of divine vision and so forth with uh, 
intuition and uh, idealism. Seven levels until we get 343 sub sub levels uh, on the cosmic physical plane. Okay. So little by little, we work our way up and, uh, you know, do we, such patience seems to be required, doesn't it? And I guess uh, the aspirant in the beginning is always in a hurry, you know, just wanting to. So on the, in the rules of the road, there is no rush, no hurry, and yet there is no time to lose. The rush and the hurry um, give us, uh, lead us along errant paths which actually don't accomplish what we want. So emotional idealism uh, on the astral plane and idealism on the third level of the buddhic plane. Okay, so contacting the soul. now. I don't know if we've thought about the methods of purifying the emotional vehicle. I don't know how much we've thought about the necessity of purifying the very powerful emotional vehicle because of the stage of development of our planetary logos and because of the polarization of our solar logos, an undivided plane. And maybe, you know, as always, reading the words of the master may think we are above and beyond these things, but uh, it's best, however much study we have given, to be realistic about whether we've achieved some of the really simple fundamentals. It may be a little humbling even humiliating to realize that we haven't. But at a certain point, you just you just have to accept things as they are and uh, do better. How else to purify the emotional vehicle? By definite periods, daily directed to the stilling of the emotional body. So much emphasize, emphasis is laid in meditation on the stilling of the mind, you know, the modifications of the versatile psychic nature, including emotions as well as the mind. So much emphasis is laid in meditation on the stilling of the mind, but it should be Remember that the stilling of the emotional nature is one step preliminary to the quieting of the mental. One succeeds the other, and it is wise to begin at the bottom of the ladder. You know, you can only imagine trying to climb a ladder by standing at the foot of it and trying to jump up five rungs suddenly without going step by step, you're probably going to fail or fall, bring the whole thing crashing down. So how many of us do this? <sighs> Definite periods of stilling. The emotional body, probably the breath will help with the steady breath, probably casting out our customary urgent desires for a little while each day uh, here and there. DK is given the simple advice, good advice, necessary advice. I guess you could 
read Cosmic Fire until your mind is filled with uh, all kinds of unverifiable yet interesting thoughts and not practice the fundamentals. You could do that. You know, I sometimes ask students, what was the very first book you picked up? Oh, it was Cosmic Fire. I got right into Cosmic Fire. Well, okay. Um, I'm sure it's very satisfying for the mind. Very intriguing. Very exalting. But how liberating is it for the consciousness? That's the question. So it's wise to begin at the foot of the ladder. You know, these are very simple things he's telling us here in summary, you know. Each aspirant must discover for himself wherein he yields most easily to violent vibrations such as fear, worry, personality, desire of any kind, I, the personality wants this personality love. We have to discriminate when we love another or love whatever. Is it based on personality satisfaction? You know, I love you because you look great. I love you because when I'm with you, other People think more of me. I love you for the prestige. You know, I love you for any number of personal reasons. So he says, some, somewhere he says, the greatest of all glamours, falling in love. Maybe the emphasis should be on the word falling because, okay, that's a personality love he's talking about. He's not talking about soul love, you know, so the glamour of attachment, the glamour of sex, glamour of all kinds of things that dwell particularly in the personality. You know, I love you because you make me feel better about myself. I mean, you know, you could just go on and on. So the uh, silent watcher is at work again. What makes us fear? What makes us worry? What throws us into strictly personality desire of any kind? Personality love of anything or anyone? Discouragement? Oversensitiveness to public opinion? You know, the love of being loved, kind of a second ray glamour there. So each aspirant has to take a look and uh, give a faithful evaluation. Let's just pause for a moment and just spend uh, just a moment. Wherein do we yield most readily to one of these violent vibrations? Yeah. I'm sure we can find these kinds of vibrations in our response set 
two circumstances. I'm just looking here, you know, so often we worry about the welfare of the near ones. So often we don't want to be alone, lonely apparently. So often we become overwhelmed when looking at the tendencies in humanity which seem to be going the wrong way. And our powers seem so little to correct those general trends. So often we worry about what people say about us and then rush to our defense instead of taking a deep breath and saying, well, you know, as DK says, they say, what do they say? Let them say. That kind of divine indifference, knowing in the long run that these slights, these arrows, slings and arrows in Hamlet's terminology <laughs> are impermanent. They pass. This too shall pass. And then, see, this is a really simple thing. You, you know, you think about what a master could write. And does write. I mean, there are, you know, places in some of the advanced books that well, you really have to ponder to think, you know, what is he saying? And what relevance can it have to my life? And then he must overcome that vibration by imposing on it a new rhythm, definitely eliminating, you know, we can use the word ohm, and constructing. Again, the use of the word OM, casting out the undesirable material. So, when thoughts contrary to yoga arise, propose thoughts contrary to the contrary thoughts. Or, you know, let Saturn represent that which is traveling in rotary motion and sustaining itself in that way. And let Uranus represent the new rhythm. Overcoming the ancient conditioning of habits. So we clean things out clean our desire nature. And then we have, uh, looks like something here. The, these first three, you know, are uh, what the the aspirant can do himself. But now it looks like something that uh, the master may be required to assist. So how else does purification occur? By work on the emotional body at night under the direction of more advanced egos working under, working under what? The guidance of the master. So we get a little help from our friends, as it were. Becomes easier. We are assisted. We don't know it, maybe, or don't remember it. By work on the emotional body at night. Provided you sleep. <laughs> of more advanced egos, uh, you know, we have that second stage of discipleship, Chela in the light, and there is an advanced ego there that makes report 
to the master of the progress of the student in the world. Maybe such an ego as that. Stimulation of vibration or the deadening of vibration follows the application of certain colors and sounds. At this particular time, two colors are being applied for many people for the purposes um, of keying up the throat and foremost head center. Looks like violet is related to the time when the seventh ray and the ability to speak the magical words comes more and more as a capacity of the throat center. And gold has to do, I think, with the um, major 12 petal center, the heart within the head. It's considered the major part of the head center. So with violet, um, Uh, do I have a violet? Not really. And I don't have a gold. <laughs> but um, at least something to suggest, you know. I don't know if any of us have memory. I mean, you know, we're in school at night. At least... Uh, if we begin to develop a kind of a continuity uh, of our sleep pattern and uh, find that it is uh, not too interrupted. And maybe during some of that um, work, maybe the entire class is subjected to the violet light or to the golden, golden colored light. So higher egos help us in occultly scientific ways to stimulate this center of purpose and to stimulate our ability to use the constructive nature of the throat center for white magical purposes, bringing the divine plan more closely uh, into consideration, into expression. Yeah. Okay. Always the wise counsel. Remember that the work is gradual. And as the polarization shifts up, the moment of transition from one subplane to another, or maybe sub subplane to another sub subplane, <laughs> is marked by certain tests applied at night that one might term a series of small initiations that eventually will be consummated in the second great initiation. Um, so what we have here is uh, between the first and second monastic initiations. We're not, in this case, I don't think we're not talking about the fourth initiation. That marks the perfection of the control of the body of emotions, because that's really what we're trying to do before the uh, baptism initiation. We are trying to do this before the baptism 
initiation. Sorry. Gradual, graded, step by step, as the ability to hold a point of tension, uh, which is ever more intense, shifts up into new vibratory realms. And I suppose if we look back on our lives, we'll see if we have studied and meditated and served that there has been that a polarization we, we might not scientifically be able to pinpoint it and say exactly when it happened and uh, or define rates and measures and that kind of thing but we'll have the general sense that we have gone through a number of transitions marked by the um, undertaking of small initiations. And uh, somewhere he talks about the initiations here between the big first and second as uh, the tests of fire, earth, air, and water. You know, operatically, you might want to go to the magic flute by Mozart, and uh, you can see the Masonic type of testing that goes on, especially uh, tests of water and fire. So it's a very occult opera and also very entertaining. So as we one after another master these smaller initiations, uh, we're controlling the body of emotions. Maybe we would learn to fly, you know, as it were on the astral plane. Certain centers or sub-centers are involved with that or, you know, maybe we climb, rise or fall or go into the earth or, or pass through the waters, you know we'll get a clearer idea of what these are as, as our faculty to uh, remember uh, becomes uh, more uh, acute. Well, here it is actually. Four small initiations find their culmination in initiation Proper, I guess this must be nope. This must be smaller initiations of the elements. I guess so. All leading to the second initiation, which really is before so many now because, you know, they would be studying with Master DK on a sustained basis if they uh, had taken the first degree particularly. And these are the initiations on the emotional plane called respectively, the initiations of earth. I wonder about the order here, earth, fire, water, and air. Culminating in initiation, the second. Okay, well, normally we might think of them uh, fire, earth, air, and water. Uh, fire, earth, air, water, 
water, air, fire, earth? Well, probably um, these have to do with the higher four subplanes of the individual astral plane. Anyway, DK was training a lot of his students, whether for this life or for a couple of lives ahead to um, deal with the preparation for the second uh, initiation, the baptism, you know, the, the kind of uh, initiation by fire in the upper room that the disciples experienced when the Christ directed them to go to the upper room and they would be uh, uh, greeted by the Holy Spirit and tongues of flame and would speak in tongues. So there, you know, there are similarities here and I'm sure many people are passing through these and, and you know, how long does it take? Uh, this has to do with the process, process on the inner planes. And I don't know if we can make uh, a general rule about it, you know. Does it take a few seconds, a few minutes, longer, whatever? But at some point, the opportunity, probably under astrological opportunity, is presented. The first initiation marks the same point of attainment on the physical plane. And, you know, again, we're dealing probably with the four elements and the four ethers. As I say, for the, for the emotional tests, we're probably dealing with the etheric part of the emotional plane. And for the tests preceding the first initiation, birth of the Christ in the heart, we're probably dealing what we normally call with what we normally call the four ethers. Each initiation marks the attainment of a certain proportion of atomic matter in the bodies. The four initiations prior to that of adept mark respectively the attainment of a proportionate amount as for instance at the first initiation one-fourth atomic matter at the second one half atomic matter and so on to consummation three quarters for the third and completed at the fourth. So it's all regulated and this progress is all part of the science of initiation and mathematics a little bit is uh, involved. Eventually, the physical body is going to disappear unless it is otherwise sustained. Matter of fact, that the fourth degree, the elemental structure of the personality vehicle disappears, uh, as does the causal body. But it is possible to regenerate the Maya Verupic personality from focus within the spiritual triad and to uh, have a mental vehicle, which is no longer uh, a kind of a gift from the solar angel, uh, an egoic lotus that is, something that is now belonging really to the man because he has earned it over the many uh, incarnations. So a proportionate amount. And, you know, we're all of us busy now building in 
atomic matter into the vehicles. There is an atomic channel. And via that atomic channel involving the first subplane of these personality planes, uh, higher impulses can descend and motivate and impel. The intuition or buddhi being the unifying principle, you know, under the second ray, the sixth principle, counting from below, being the unifying principle and thus wielding, welding, that is welding all, at the fourth initiation, the lower vehicles go and the adept stands in his, well, he's an adept in his intuitional body and creates from thence the body of manifestation. The, is the, my rope is created from the spiritual triad. At first, the Buddhic, a Buddhic aspect of it, apparently. So, you know, unless the adept finds a way to sustain the birthed body beyond the fourth degree, apparently Master DK uh, did that, but Master Moria and KH apparently are using Maya Virupas. So the appearance may be that of a, a vehicle that looks very much like the personality vehicle that existed before, but it has a different point of origin and the lunar lords, which uh, provided so much uh, difficulty as aspects of the personality as the dweller are no longer present in that Maya Virupic manifestation. So we have this to look forward to. And, you know, before so very long, because uh, adepts of the fifth degree are needed. And let's just say, note that the uh, initiate is called uh, an adept even at the fourth initiation usually he is called an arhat and we wait until the fifth initiation for the term adept. Sorry. To be used. But, you know, language is not always entirely exact. And then and I think I will go on until uh, we reach number 11. The next one is about the refinement of the mental body. Just a couple of pages, but you know, that can take a while. <laughs> I just hope that as we're reading this together, we are impressed by uh, the necessity really to undertake this refinement, no matter at what point of life in an incarnation we may find ourselves. Of course, it's always good to be able to undertake this when one has one's full energetic faculties. So we then go into the refinement of the mental body. This is the result of hard work and discrimination, you know, 
I don't know how many of us love to study and study in a way that really benefits, but it takes that and uh, a kind of meditative approach to life. Discrimination is the city, the power that is found on the fourth sublevel of the mental plane for the individual and from discrimination, it is possible to enter into the causal body where the faculty of spiritual discernment uh, begins to really occur. In other words, we can notice, discern, point out, uh, detect um, the spiritual factor present within the normal factor. So hard work and discrimination and, you know, Alice Bailey seemed to tell us that, yeah, we're a bit mentally lazy after all. So we can ask ourselves about that. So this uh, refinement necessitates three things. And here we go again, you know, tabulations and lists and outlines. Before the plane of the mental unit, uh, which is the uh, fourth subplane, is achieved. And before the causal consciousness, the full consciousness of the higher, as higher self or that aspect of the higher self is reached necessitates three things so you know we'll take stock and we'll see whether these three things are part of our approach now number one the first thing required before the full consciousness of the higher self can be said to be ours is clear thinking. Not just on subjects wherein the interest is aroused, but on all matters affecting the race. It involves the formulation of thought matter and the capacity to define, we might call it usually, sorry, usually a fifth ray ability. It means the ability to make thought forms out of thought matter and to utilize those thought forms for the helping of the public. He who does not think clearly and who has an inchoate, you know, not, not too well formed mental body lives in a fog and a man in a fog uh, is but a blind leader of the blind. We don't want to fall into that uh, unenviable condition which is doing nobody any good. So thought formulation in all clarity, well defined, you know, the Fifth ray and the seventh ray certainly help. And uh, somewhere I think Annie Besant says uh, fifth ray exactitude in action and third ray exactitude in thought. But there's plenty of exactitude in thought required in relation to the fifth ray, too. So we face the world with an acute mind. 
we have what's called the acute energy of divine mental perception. It's on the third ray. Um, so, facing the world with an acute mind regarding all things. You know, sometimes we say, hey, I don't want to think about that. Oh, that doesn't interest me. And we allow sloppy thought to be directed to those things that don't interest us very much and we never learn. And we're very keen about what does interest us. But we have to realize that so many things do touch the helping of the public things that don't interest us, but that we may maybe karmically or dharmically required to address. So that calm, limpid, reflective astral body and clear, precise thought with the ability to define, define clearly what the issues are and what the approaches can be. So that's number one, clear thinking. And, uh, you know, what can I do here? Number one. And then there is uh, the ability to still the mental body. Let's see if uh, this is correct. Okay. Correct enough, I think. The ability to still the mental body so that the thoughts from abstract levels and from the intuitional planes of the triad can find a receptive sheet whereon may be in, they may inscribe themselves. The Basically, what we're doing is we're stilling the modifications of the versatile psychic nature. Hmm. Let's see if I no. Well, anyway, probably good enough. So we're, let's call it um, stilling the modifications of the versatile uh, psychic nature, especially of the lower mind. Sorry. Whoop. This thought has been made clear in many books on concentration and meditation. It needs not my elucidation. It is the result of hard practice, not sloppy practice or haphazard practice, carried on over many years. All right. So we still the mind. Not only do we discriminate, but we still the mind. All right. And then a definite process brought about by the master in this case, with the acquiescence of the disciple, the agreement to of the disciple, which welds into a permanent shape, the hard won efforts and results of many years. So we see that 
there's always a certain amount of work that has to be done by the disciple, and then the finishing touches are put on by the initiator. Um, yeah. So I'll make that one big. It's like the shoemaker and the elves, you know, the old story about the poor shoemaker who just couldn't get his shoes together on time to make a living. And, but he noticed that if he laid out the different parts that had to go into the shoe in the morning, the shoe was completed. How did that happen? Well, the elves, the intuition, the master, they were at work at night. And the man prepared the materials and then the finishing touches were put upon uh, by, by the master. Uh, so that is uh, a possibility also. Hmm? I'm just trying to uh, make this correct in some way. And, uh, yeah, clear thinking. Okay. And I'll put that as number one. All right. Clear thinking. Stilling the mental body. And work of a kind that we may not understand by the master or the supervising ego. At each initiation, the electrical or magnetic force applied has a stabilizing effect, but of course, um, we have to prepare for that stabilization, which comes from a higher source. It renders durable the results achieved by the disciple. You know, yes, uh, the potter analogy, like the potter molds and shapes the clay and then applies the fire that solidifies, so the aspirin shapes and molds and builds and prepares for the solidifying fire, um, which is initiation. Initiation marks a permanent attainment. It's not um, easily broken. And the beginning of a new cycle of endeavor. So this is, um, we prepare. And this has to do with the old statement that the initiate is initiate before uh, he is initiated. So we have a lot of work to do to reach that point where in a way the pot is prepared, but still weak and soft and is rendered hard, resistant, permanent by the initiator. So we have three things then involved here with the uh, purification. 
practice of clear thinking and discrimination, the ability to still the um, the mental body and receive from the abstract and intuitive levels. Um, so thoughts from the abstract and intuitive levels can find a receptive sheet. The whole divine plan, we're told, is written in symbols on uh, sheets on sheets of metal of a certain alloy. This is what he tells us. And then a definite process brought about by the master with the acquiescence of the disciple, which welds into permanent shape. The hard won effort of many years. Don't we get the sense that patience is constantly being invoked um, as a necessity? So, above all, two things should be emphasized above all. So we're talking about, above all, emphasizing two things. Number one, again, uh, maybe I'll make this quite large so we know where to go. A steady, unshaken perseverance that wrecks not of time nor hindrance, but goes on. This capacity to persevere explains why the non-spectacular um, non-spectacular man so frequently attains initiation before the genius and before the man who attracts more notice <laughs> and then something that the arcane school I think has really adopted as one of its uh, mantrams <laughs> the ability to plod is much, much to be desired. One step after another. <clears throat> so this is something, you know, the second ray really has this. Sometimes the first ray, not as much. It goes crashing through. Second ray has this ability, but first ray goes uh, crashing through sporadically. When you have the combination of the two, of course, it's a very valuable combination. So, plot on persevere, persist, and, oh, this will take forever, you know, but, in fact, we always have forever, or at least we have so much time, given universal process, that our normal time considerations uh, become trivial to us from a certain perspective, you know, when at last we gain a, a, a truer uh, perspective. So plot on. And um, I'm thinking, you know, I've been at this 50 years or more.
maybe uh, 60 years in this incarnation. And this, <laughs> this is wise advice. What else can you do? You have to achieve what is laid before us and there's no, um, no shortcuts. And when you stop to think, I often do anyway, of what absolute infinitude really is and how not only are we a part of it, but we are it. So many of our time pressures, uh, the personality rushes, you know, says DK, because it realizes the time is short. That is for the existence of a particular personality. But what is the real identity? Uh, in all of its um, <clears throat> foreverness and timelessness. Now those are words, but uh, if we begin to understand more deeply what is the story, and that, you know, that's very real, then the usual short-sighted time pressures can be relieved. And also now, a progress that is made without undue self-analysis. Undue. You know, we can become overly obsessed about whether we're making the grade really have fulfilled the requirements of initiation, which is probably indicating that we want somehow initiation for ourselves, for the little self. And that is not really what is initiated. The initiation is occurring in the causal body with reflected results in the little self. Pull not yourself up by the roots to see if there is growth. Obviously, you're unrooting yourself when you do that and your sources of sustainment um, are temporarily uh, cut off. Your sources of nourishment are temporarily cut off. So a certain don't care attitude again is required. We know we will make the grade and uh, undo worry about <clears throat> whether we are making progress or not just robs from the service that we might do that actually contributes to the progress. So this uh, excessive introspection, it takes precious time. Forget your own progress in conforming to the rules and in helping others. Speak not of self, pity not thy fate, thoughts of self and of thy lower destiny. Prevent the inner voice of the soul from striking on thine ear. Speak of the soul and lodge upon the plan, lose thyself in, what does it say, building for the world. Thus will the law of form be offset. Thus will the rule of love enter upon the world. So that's one of the last ones of the uh, 15 councils. <clears throat> that begin uh, on page 473 of a treatise on white magic. So we forget our own progress in conforming to the rules and in the helping of others. Self forgetfulness in the sense of the lower self. Take your eyes off your 
little self. The eyes are upon the big self, and then, you know, it's it's timelessness and its purity will be realized. So that when we truly do spend our time conforming to the rules and in helping others, when this is so, sudden illumination may come and the realization break upon you that the point has been reached when the Hierophant can demand your presence and bestow initiation upon you. You have by hard work and sheer endeavor to conform to the law. We can see the Tibetans quite strict in certain ways, right? And to love all, you have built into your bodies the material that makes it possible for you to stand in his presence, whether <clears throat> the Christ or Sanat Kumara or others. The great law of attraction draws you to him and not can withstand that law. You know how very beautiful and inevitable all this is. for little man to contemplate. And not can withstand the law. You see how conformity, how Saturn is needed for the law. We see how Neptune is needed for love. And um, very much here, Vulcan building into your bodies the material that will make it possible for you to stand in his presence. And he is Uranus itself, wielding the electric rod, the great law of attraction draws you to him and not can withstand the law, the strongest law in our system. Given the second ray soul and probable ultimate second ray monad of our solar logos. Well, okay. Um, the next section is letter 11. The number of the hierarchy. And it takes us to the end of the book to page 350. So not quite sure that that's the thing to do right now. And then again, then we'll go back to the new esoteric schools. I mean, I could just leave it to you and say, please go read the big commentary on that. But maybe this method also of the video commentaries allows you to do other things while you are listening. I always used to get my exercise in, you know, long walks and uh, jogs and things like that while listening to the great books here. Uh, learning how to really capitalize upon the time available. So you'll have a choice there. Sometimes I haven't given you a choice because, you know, I think my days of writing, writing detailed commentaries are over and it's uh, more doable 
uh, to do these video commentaries at the at the moment. So we'll go into rule 11, or rather, letter 11. And then that will complete the book, but then we'll go back to letter number nine, which is all about the future that um, many who are interested in the banded esoteric organisms, that is the new schools, uh, will uh, adhere to. The, it will provide them with much to do in coming incarnations. Now, maybe some here will be working in the New World religion or even in masonry, politics, and so forth. Uh, who's to say what our home ashram is and what our particular duty may be? Master DK is training us in a general sense to be ready for any kind of assignment. So it does really bring it all down, you know, finally, because even going to a new school, I mean, if it doesn't end in what rule 11 is talking about here, the re resultant life of service, then it's all been uh, a bit burdensome and uh, karmically obligating and in vain. It has to end with the resultant life of service. And uh, the kind of service that we'll be called upon to do is far in excess of the service we've already rendered. We'll just become ever more adequate servers, ever better representatives of whatever ashram it may be, maybe at first Master DK's ashram, uh, ever more faithful and effective representatives of the divine plan. Okay, friends, so uh, we'll get this out to you on uh, at least in a couple of places. And um, the first place will be Makara, and the second place, if we can manage it, will be the Moria Federation Esoteric Education YouTube channel. We'll, um, We'll do our best. So lots of love and many blessings to everybody. And let's realize the gift we have been given by Master DK. It's quite extraordinary. And let's take advantage of that in these, especially in these four years that remain before the momentous great conclave of 2025. So we'll be seeing you soon. And bye-bye for now.